Hey, colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to this Lord Speaker lecture on mental health. And it's great to see a full turnout in the robing room. And we're joined by peers, MPs, members of staff, representatives of mental health charities, and a colleague from the Press Association. But why are we here? Tonight's lecture grew from an interesting conversation on the Rest is Politics podcast. I was walking through Hyde Park, listening to Alistair Campbell, praising Sir Charles Walker as the MP of the year. So there and then I decided I will have the two of them along to the Lord Speaker's lecture on that. Alistair spoke about Charles' great courage when he used the debate in the House of Commons back in 2012 to reveal his own mental illness. That debate in which Charles and other MPs, including Kevin Jones, I don't know if Kevin's here tonight, but uh, Kevin and Charles spoke very openly about, oh, Kevin's there, good Kevin, uh, their situation. And Kevin made the point that not even his family knew about the situation uh, in that discussion. But the debate tonight opened the discussion in the country and it's emblematic of the work which we must do tonight. That entails, as Charles' speech demonstrates, a real openness and honesty about the subject. That candour appears as well in so much of Alistair's work on mental health. Charles was clear about the scale of the issue. He said, society has the biggest part to play. This is society's problem. He was right then and he is right now. He knew that he was courting controversy by placing his mental health at the centre of the debate. Nevertheless, he went forward all the same. I'm also pleased to introduce our other guest speaker, Alistair. Uh, but no one could ever accuse Alistair of courting controversy. <laughs> his work on the subject is deeply personal, but so too is his experience in his campaigning, his documentaries, his podcast, and in his writings. I was particularly inspired by his book, Living Better, where he demonstrates his commitment to ensuring understanding and action on mental health. And that's the aim of tonight, to ensure that we all leave with a full understanding of these issues and an empathy, compassion, and a realization of how we can effect change. Because we all have a role to play in this. Parity of esteem for mental and physical health is an old idea, announced as far back as the 1950s by, believe it or not, Enoch Powell as the Minister of Health, who closed all the grim asylums. That lesson was reiterated in 2012 in the Health and Social Care Act, where Baroness Hollands and others in the House of Lords, along with Lord Stevenson, led that. But tonight, we will learn what steps we can take to make this a reality, and therefore, I welcome Sir Charles and ask him to make the first contribution. Charles. I'm looking at there it is. Thank you. Well, um, so I've never actually given a lecture before. I've given lots of speeches, off-the-cuff speeches, but not a lecture, so I thought I should write something down so you would be reassured I prepared for this. Now, it is pretty scary to do your first lecture as the warm-up act for <laughs> Alistair Campbell. Um, I know that there are, well, there are four members of my family here today. I'd like to think they're all here to, to hear me but at least two of them have admitted they wouldn't have come but for Alistair Campbell. So, so I think, Alistair, uh, the room is yours, and you know that Alistair is a hero of the movement. He's spoken so movingly about his own experiences and the health struggles of his late brother, Donald. So I, I suppose, Lord Speaker, in this beautiful room with lots of paintings, uh, we are painting pictures with words. And there was a remarkable man called Edward Adamson who used art to huge and great effect during his 35 years as a psychiatrist at Nethern Hospital. Um, his patients created amazing art between 1946 
1981. It was groundbreaking. And this amazing collection was going to be broken up until the Wellcome Foundation saved it for the nation a few years ago with a £6 million grant. They basically bought it for the nation. And the paintings and sketches contained in the collection are extraordinary and profound. Now, I have some, uh, I, I have some, not the originals, but I have some on my wall, prints, and I thought I'd just bring one with me, which is here. And I'll let you absorb that for a moment, but it is quite clear that this is the patient and this is the patient psychiatrist. Really deeply moving and powerful stuff. And as I say, at the time, totally groundbreaking. And if you have a chance to go and see it, I certainly suggest that, that you do. But I have to be honest, unlike so many of you here tonight, this gentleman, Baroness Hollins, when it comes to the subject of mental health, I'm a bit of an ingenue, or at best, an interested amateur. I have no qualifications in this field. My footprint in the sand is not deep, and it will be easily washed away when I leave, but for now, it is a footprint. And my journey along this sandy beach started nearly three decades ago, on a summer's day, much like today, close, hot and humid. I was a recently married young man in my late twenties, getting off a tube at South Kensington Station. It was a busy evening, and through the melee of people arriving and departing on the platform, I saw a young woman sitting on a bench in a state of high distress. I see her now as clearly as I did more than 25 years ago. She was distressed, very distressed. She was crying, manic, rocking. I remember her shoes without laces and the fine dust caking her face. And our interaction was very brief. It resulted in me leaving her and finding two sympathetic police officers who kindly wanted to help. I suspect for that young woman, it was one of many unsatisfactory interactions. But for me, it was profound. And it is an encounter that I will return to in my closing remarks. So Lord Speaker, the question we're speaking to tonight is when it comes to mental health, have we done enough? In answering that question, I'm comfortable in saying we've done quite a lot, but not yet enough. It is certainly the case that over the past 15 years, there has been a sea change in the way we relate to the issue of mental health. As a society, we are in the main far more sympathetic and understanding. This enlightenment is reflected in public discourse, the media reporting of mental ill health, and of course the willingness of Parliament to lead change. But I do want to ad lib something here. Yesterday, the Daily Mail, which has a proud record in the area of mental health, it was on Monday, had two videos of people in mental distress on its website, reporting that as news, with people making comment about it. That was a step backwards, and I'm surprised that its editor, as I say, it's a newspaper with a proud record, let it happen. But let us focus on the positive tonight, because it was certainly the case about a decade ago that there was a sea change in the way we approached mental health. I'm not sure there was a defining moment. These things tend to be organic. But in 2013, Gavin Barwell, then of our house, that one with the green carpets, introduced a groundbreaking private members' build, championed by Lord Stevenson, who was in your house and is taking a, a break. The bill entitled the Mental Health Discrimination Bill sought to put an end to the historic discriminations that allowed companies and schools to remove people with a history of mental illness from their boards. Discriminations that prevented them from serving on juries and dismissed them from this House of Commons if they became ill. The changes it made were important, but the message it sent out was bigger. The legislation struck at the heart of stigma, going beyond talk into the realm of action. And many of you will know this victory was not won easily. 
Beyond the chamber work, there were hundreds of hours of meetings, planning and lobbying. And we were fortunate to find good people in government, good people in White House Hall, and good people both in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. People willing to be persuaded that it was the right thing to do. And around this time, there really was a surge of interest in mental health and its importance. In 2012, the Health and Social Care Act enshrined parity of esteem between physical and mental health. Alistair will know party leaders referred to mental health in their speeches and the subject was widely discussed in our communities, schools and workplaces with a plethora of initiatives and exciting things happening. I could read you a list, but it would be just a list. It's there, House of Commons Library has it. A lot of good stuff happened. I can safely say mental health had arrived. One in five became a widely campaigned statistic. This number was soon changed to one in four. And while I take great pleasure in the taboos attached to mental health being blown away, I remain profoundly uncomfortable in the way one in four is being campaigned. I am uncomfortable with this number because for parity of esteem to really mean something, there has to be a recognition that, as with physical illness, there is a wide spectrum of mental illness. Some mild, some life-altering. We would never equate a bout of flu with stage four cancer or life-changing and life-limiting brittle bone disease. My manageable OCD, however difficult it can be at times, is not in the same order as serial bouts of severe depression, recurring suicidal thoughts, or a diagnosis of psychosis schizophrenia. And we diminish ourselves, and we diminish parity of esteem and mental ill health if we do not recognise and acknowledge these differences. In her book, Losing Our Minds, the psychologist Lucy Fuchs writes, everything we might think of as symptoms of mental disorder, worry, low mood, binge eating, delusions, actually exists as a continuum throughout the population. The thoughts, feelings and behaviours that appear temporarily as a natural response to hardship and stress like when we're heartbroken, exactly mimic those that, should they persist, are defining features of mental disorders. So, of course, I want people who are struggling to be able to get help and support. Of course, I recognise that at times this support is difficult to access and waiting lists are often long. Of course, I understand that there is much to be done to improve matters and, of course, I know that current and future ministers will continue to wrestle with this challenge from whatever party they are drawn. But Lord Speaker, we must guard against medicalising the human condition. At times, we will all feel anxious, we will all feel down, and we will all feel unhappy. These emotions are triggered by loss, change, and bluntly by doing something stupid. Our emotions are part of who we are. But as Lucy Fuchs observes, it is when our mood impedes our ability to function and participate that the threshold of illness is crossed and help is needed. So in advance of that threshold being reached, we must find mechanisms that promote the importance of mental well-being and resilience. Lord Speaker, like many here this evening, I'm invited to school assemblies to discuss these subjects. Children are enormously receptive to the idea that growing up can be challenging and to get the best out of it, you need to look after yourself and those around you. So a friend who makes you feel bad or sad isn't a friend. Your mobile device doesn't have your best interests at heart. At times you will fail, but if you get back up, you will eventually succeed. And in this age of media and sensory overload, being a child is so much more difficult than it was when most of us were growing up. And I say that with apologies to my daughter. Perhaps you have grown up. Um, I recall that at the age of 10, I was vaguely aware of the Cold War. 
but my parents made a conscious effort to keep their grown-up concerns amongst the grown-ups. But now too often, we seem all too willing to co-opt our children into our fears, from killing their grandmother with COVID, to the climate change crisis, the threat of a Russian nuclear strike, AI fears, and so it goes on. All these things are real, but childhood is so short. We all know what is going on, and we, the adults in the room, are frightened and anxious. But now let us better understand how children respond to our anxiety, better understand how it stimulates their state of mind and behaviours, better appreciate the damage that it can do to them. So do we have a duty to insulate children from our fears and concerns? I think we do. And when looking for who's responsible for the wave of anxiety sweeping through our schools, perhaps at times we need to look no further than ourselves. We try to protect our children from physical harm, but as adults, we are too often failing when it comes to protecting their mental well-being. The flow into the pipeline of unhappiness and illness will only be restricted through hard work, hard work in our schools and hard work in our homes. Teachers, as my daughter tells me often, cannot do this alone. So, Lord Speaker, building resilience and well-being is a challenge for our age. But I want to return now to that young woman I met on a platform all those years ago and the illness she was battling. I suspect it is a lifelong illness, a life-altering condition. And I thought of this young woman when reading a devastating article carried in The Guardian three weeks ago by Eleanor de Jong. Eleanor, an Australian-based journalist, wrote the following about her own struggles. In the last decade, I have noticed a shift in how openly mental health is discussed. How many people are willing to claim psychiatric disorders as their own or armchair diagnose those around them? It's fine to ask for help if you're struggling. Great even. To be encouraged. But I'd pay every single dollar in my bank account not to have bipolar. But that doesn't mean it's a stand-in for dysfunction. Your life is going a bit off the rails, shouldn't have you reaching for psychiatric terminology or claiming a diagnosis or wondering why your ex, what your ex has to make him such a dickhead. Sorry, Lord Speaker, but I had to give the quote. When you do this, it undermines the lives of those who are stuck with these illnesses and have to struggle pretty much every day to survive them. Because for us, it's not a phase or a bad patch. You do get better, but then you usually get worse again. For us, it's forever. Eleanor's de Jong read is a shattering read, but it needs to be read. It is still the case that a diagnosis of psychosis schizophrenia is estimated to shorten someone's life by between 15 and 20 years. And since we started talking about mental health, in the positive terms that we now do, that figure has remained a constant. This should not and must not be allowed to stand. This inequality in life expectancy has to be narrowed, with the ambition being to eliminate it. Lord Speaker, last Tuesday I was sitting on my station platform with my wife, Fiona. I was approached by a man and asked if I was an MP. Of course, I said yes. This admission triggered a verbal assault. Having been called a bastard, I was informed that I was going to pay for the death of Sean Mason, that they were coming to get me. Mr. Sp Mr. Lord Speaker, I was frightened and angry and responded robustly. On reflection, I could have handled things better. But who was Sean Mason? and why the rage levelled at me for my alleged complicity in his death. I now know of a Sean Mason. The Sean Mason I know of died alone in his car on September the 13th, 2020. He was found by the police at 5.50 p.m. that afternoon. Sean Mason had a history of self-harm, addiction 
and suicidal thoughts. According to his partner and mother, he had recently been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. They described him as a beautiful, kind and loving soul. They loved him very much. People wanted to help Sean. His life was difficult. Telephone calls were missed. Following Sean's death, the Mental Health Trust conducted a serious investigation. Lessons were learned, changes were made. Sean Mason died aged 46. Many in this room will know a great deal more about schizophrenia and serious mental illness than I do. But what I do know from my work with Baroness Hollins and others is that it is hard. It is hard and demanding. It places huge strains on the sufferer. It places huge strains on the family. It places huge strains on health services and social workers. It presents huge challenges to policymakers as we seek to balance the rights and the needs of sufferers. Sheila Hollins knows a lot. I know so little. But I am confident in saying this. For parity of esteem to mean something, it has to mean more than one in four. It has to mean more than one in four for that young woman on South Kensington Station. It has to mean more than one in four for Sean Mason and his grieving friends and family. It has to mean more than one in four for Eleanor de Jong. And I want to end with the opening line of Eleanor's Guardian article. It is great mental health is now openly discussed, but the sickest people I've known, myself included, have had almost no part in it. Lord Speaker, there is legislation planned to help change this. It needs to come soon. We're waiting for the government to bring it forward. I now hand over to the main act, Alistair Campbell. <laughs> well done, Charles. That was very good. Uh, right, well, here we are, the House of Lords. I've said no a few times. <clears throat> Probably say no a few more times before I fly away. Uh, I want to start with mentioning two Charleses. The first is the one we've heard. Charles Walker, Sir Charles Walker. And that debate, 11 years ago, and I remember it because I remember at the time people saying, isn't it amazing, four MPs have opened up about their mental health struggles. And it was like front page news because four MPs had talked about having mental health challenges. And yet that was, and we all know is, a fraction of those who've known mental ill health. And not that many, let's be honest, not that many have gone down the road that Kevin and Charles and others went. The second Charles I want to mention is Charles Kennedy. He knew mental ill health all too well. Depression, anxiety, alcoholism, I've known them, and I got lucky. It's interesting that Charles mentioned two kindly policemen. It was two kindly policemen who, I think, saved my life because they arrested me when I was behaving very strangely in a public place, and they asked me if I was all right. And for the first time ever, I said, I don't think I am. And the second one said, do you want to come with us? And I said, I think I do. And I didn't have a clue who they were. Turned out they were plainclothes policemen. And off I went. And that was the start, if you like, of my recovery. A road to recovery that I still tread very, very carefully by looking after myself better than I used to. Charles Kennedy hesitated to get the help that he knew he needed. And it's a reasonable hesitation for MPs to worry about what others, opponents, media, constituents, might think and say, 
All I would say is that I have never, ever regretted being open. Indeed, I think my openness has been an important part of my recovery. And I have to say, I don't know if you found the same, Charles, I found people almost universally supportive and understanding. And I'm more than ever convinced that until people feel, all of us, that we can be as open about our mental health as we are about our physical health, then stigma and taboo will remain, leading to continuing discrimination, misunderstanding and unnecessary pain, up to and including death. Whether through suicide, still the biggest killer of young men in this country, or in Charles's case, through alcoholism. Now, four prime ministers ago, when Theresa May stood in Downey Street and promised to address burning injustices, the fact that she included mental health among them suggested the issue was rising up the political agenda. Her predecessor, David Cameron, had also said mental health was a priority. His Chancellor, George Osborne, made a big thing of announcing extra funding. And I was earlier today at King's College, where I was made a fellow. Apparently it doesn't allow me to be a psychiatrist. I was very, very hurt by that. <laughs> and some of the people who were there were saying that some of that money came through and some of that money made a difference. But, let's be frank about it, the signature policy of the Cameron Osborne years was austerity and it has had a severe impact on mental health services, not least with the return to their traditional place at the back of the NHS queue. In 2018, Matt Hancock, appointed by Theresa May to be Health Secretary, hosted a global mental health summit and he invited me to speak at it. And introducing me, he said he felt it was, quote, great that we're talking about mental health more. And I agreed. But I said I felt the talking had been going on long enough. And it was time that governments really started to deliver on that promise written into the National Health Service Constitution of parity. Because let's be honest, we're a long, long way from it. However, as with Mrs May's speech on taking office, David Cameron's rhetoric, Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg's support for the sadly now defunded Time to Change campaign, positive change in volume and tone of media coverage about mental health, at least it all made campaigners hopeful that we were getting somewhere. Since then, however, I do feel, not least of what I call, because of what I call my ABC, austerity, Brexit and COVID, most in the mental health sector would argue we've gone backwards since those days. Now, sometimes campaigns have to be fought and refought and refought before real progress is made. And I think this is one of those fights. So how to fight it and how to make the change we need. We need to change the lens through which we look at the issue. First, through that greater openness, key to breaking down stigma and taboo. Second, by recognising that a preventative approach would end up saving money for the state. We don't, in my view, really have a mental health service. We have a mental illness service. If I went out the window and jumped and survived, they'd find me a bed at St Thomas's by the end of the day. But on the many steps from good health to the crisis point, all too often, the help that might prevent the crisis being reached isn't there. And MPs of all parties and in all parts of the country have got stories from their constituencies to back that up. So early intervention, particularly in schools, colleges and workplaces, has to be better than waiting for the crisis to come. And that's why I felt the recent statement by the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, that his officers will no longer answer call-outs related to mental health unless there is a risk of loss of life was so concerning. I understand his frustration because there's been a shift from the NHS as our front line to the police as our front line, which has become normalised 
in a very short period of time. So third, we have to reverse that trend. Now, I did get Charles Kennedy to agree to go to a place I know in the Scottish borders called Castle Craig. And he said he was up for it. But by the time I went back to him with dates and rates, he'd got reasons to put it off. He had a sick father who needed his help. He had an important speech to make. He had a planning meeting for the next election. And so it went on. And the reason I knew about Castle Craig and felt it could have been good for Charles is because it's the place where my son, Callum, sorted out his troubled relationship with alcohol and, touch wood, an AA regular, he's not touched alcohol for 10 years. But I often wonder, in a feeling of slight panic, what we would have done if we'd been unable to pay as many alcoholics and their families cannot. So fourth, we have to stop the drift to mental health care being a luxury only the well-off can afford, especially as it is likely to be the poor who need it most. Castle Craig is a place where mainly British alcoholics mingle with mainly Dutch drug addicts. The latter sent there at public expense by a government which understands that long-term savings can be made for the state if we invest in treating people with serious addiction issues as people who are ill. Some relapse after what is very expensive treatment, but many do not. And when those that don't are able to become healthy, productive citizens again, everyone gains from that. So I wish we could be as enlightened as the Dutch are on that. Change the lens. Fifth, the role of employers is vital in this struggle. Thank you both for mentioning my brother Donald. When I gave the eulogy to Donald at his funeral, I thanked his employer, above all others, Glasgow University. And Donald, who is the main reason I campaign in this, er er this area, he had, as Charles has said, schizophrenia, diagnosed in his early 20s, forcing him to leave the Scots Guards. Later got a job with the university at Glasgow. He was the official piper and he worked in the security department. And they employed him for 27 years. And the reason I singled them out for praise is because they never saw him as a schizophrenic. He was an employee who had schizophrenia and there's a very, very big difference. Too many employers define mentally ill staff by their illness in a way they do not when it concerns physical illness. I was not introduced to you tonight as the asthmatic Alastair Campbell. Theresa May is never introduced as our diabetic former Prime Minister. Sixth, research. Because of the stigma surrounding serious mental illness, it's at the wrong end of the research queue. So that those on a lifetime of antipsychotics, for example, as Charles has said, live on average 20 years less than the rest of us. My father was 82 when he died. My brother Donald, after a lifetime on antipsychotics, was 62. Imagine if we knew that the drugs we take for asthma or diabetes might shorten our life by so long. Would we accept that? Or might we move with the speed we move to find a COVID vaccine and find better treatments and cures? Seventh, words matter. A plea to all of you, please never use the phrase commit suicide when we talk about someone who ends their own life. We commit sins and we commit crimes. Suicide is neither. It is the ultimate in mental illness. Let's stop referring to schizophrenia as a split personality or using the word schizophrenic when we mean somebody has good moods and bad, or Burnley played well in the first half, but less well in the second half. It minimizes, it misunderstands, it stigmatizes. So what I'm arguing for is that we change the lens on the way we think, 
the way we talk and the way we act in relation to mental health. To campaign to eradicate discrimination, to end the inequality of access, which means less than a fifth of those who would benefit from talking therapy get it. To understand that long waiting times are even worse when the illness is of the mind. To end disincentives in the system, which mean mental health is the service most likely to be cut. To stop people being shunted around the country for treatment. To stop mentally ill kids being locked up in police cells. To accept that prisons are full of people who should be in hospital, not jail. And to do that research, to develop that preventative mental health service. But also, if I can move to the final argument in my plea to change the lens, not just to speak up for the mentally ill as people who need support, but to speak up for the mentally ill as often major contributors to our life and times. Anything I have achieved in my life, I don't feel I've done so, as a Daily Telegraph journalist once put it, despite a history of mental ill health, but in part, frankly, because of it. The resilience that comes from surviving breakdown, the ability to deal with setback, a thick skin, loyalty to others close to me who have been loyal to me, the energy and the creativity that comes whenever I emerge from a depressive episode. When Charles died, Charles Kennedy, you're not dead, Charles, you're fine. When Charles Kennedy died, there were many who said, had it not been for his drinking, Charles could have been a truly great politician. To me, it was like saying Churchill could have been even greater, but for his black dog and his tendency to drown it in scotch. Abraham Lincoln would have been even greater without his melancholia. Clinton would have had a near perfect presidential reputation had he not had a Kennedy-esque sex drive. That's JFK, not Charles. <laughs> an American friend of mine, a guy called Nasegami, he's an academic psychiatrist and he's written a book about Martin Luther King, arguing that K King became a great leader not despite being manic depressive, but frankly, because he was manic depressive. The mania gave him energy and high self-esteem, which contrib contributed to his charisma, to his forward thinking, important in strategy. And his depressive side, and particularly his understanding of human emotional pain, allowed him to be an exceptional, empathetic team, later, team leader. And the reason it's important to understand this is that a lot of stigma is still attached to anything that smacks of abnormal mental activity. But abnormal doesn't always mean sick. I don't want my politicians to be normal. I want them to be special. Political life is not normal. It is in many ways a laboratory for mental ill health. The hours, the pressures, the separation from family and community, the shocks and the setbacks, the volume and nature of issues to deal with, the public hate and toxicity, particularly since the advent of social media. And it'd be far better to acknowledge all that and to work on it, but most of us, let's be honest, we just plough on. And get this, sport is primarily physical. Yet you won't find many top athletes who do not have proper psychological support. Politics is primarily mental. Yet, do politicians really focus on looking after their mental health and well-being? They and the country would be a lot better if they did. So there we are. I hope I've persuaded some of you to look after yourselves better but also to get involved in campaigning on this, because it's through campaigning that we make change. And I really do hope we can look back one day and ask ourselves, did we really accept medications that haven't advanced for half a century? Did we really think that the mentally ill were more likely to be violent than the general population? when in truth, they're more likely to be victims of violence? 
Did we really think it was okay to discriminate in the workplace on the grounds of somebody admitting to a mental health problem, which still happens all too often today? And here is the hope bit on which I want to end. The same stigma and taboo used to surround cancer. The big C. Why did we call it the big C? Because we didn't want to say it was cancer. I remember as a child being told by my mother that our neighbour, Mr Whittaker, had cancer. You mustn't tell anybody, she said. Now, young people here will think that is ridiculous, and it was, to some extent, ridiculous, but that was the taboo of the time. That taboo, having been stripped away, has been a good thing for those who have cancer, for those who treat cancer, and for those who raise funds for the fight against it. And I know, as somebody who tries to raise funds for mental health charities, it's a lot easier to raise money for cancer than it is for mental health. So we need the same stripping away of the taboo surrounding mental health, because only then, I believe, can we begin to take steps towards making a reality of that promise of parity between mental and physical health. It's a commitment far from being met, yet which surely must be one of the definitions of a civilised country at ease with itself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs>